Hello, my name's Gideon Cordova and this is my two cents adjusted for inflation. Today we're going to be doing a quick tour of modern monetary theory. Under Roosevelt's New Deal, the United States employed millions of previously unemployed workers and they used their labour to build massive public infrastructure works which lasted for decades to come. Things like roads, the interstate highways, schools, hospitals, dams like the Hoover Dam. They even hired actors and musicians to travel the country bringing culture and the arts to millions. They created national infrastructure such as the thousands of miles of hiking trails through Yosemite and Yellowstone National Parks. In the United Kingdom and in Australia just after World War II there were similar massive spending sprees that took place in which we managed to get free universal education and uh, free tertiary higher level education here in Australia and in the United Kingdom in England they managed to introduce universal free public health care and so the National Health Service in England 70 years later is still the envy of many healthcare systems around the world. So immediately after World War II, we were able to implement all of this public spending, even though our debt to GDP ratio was much higher than it is today. So for instance, in Australia, in the 1940s, 50s and 60s, we were running public debt that was some six, seven, eight times higher than it is today. So how were we able to afford it? Where did the money come from? As Stuart Chase was writing in the 1940s, he was an American economist, he was asking how did nations like Italy and Germany, Japan and Russia, all nations which were ostensibly bankrupt, how were they able to mobilise all of their unemployed people and afford to build all of the armaments that were required to fight World War II? How did these nations which had very limited gold reserves and had no foreign creditors who were willing to lend them lines of credit, how were they able to find the money to fight World War II and to unleash that devastation that took place during that period? Well, it's a very good question. Tony Benn, who is a former British politician, said, After the war, people said, If you can plan for war, why can't you plan for peace? When I was 17, I had a letter from the government saying, Dear Mr Benn, will you turn up when you're 17 and a half? We'll give you free food, free clothes, free training, free accommodation, and two shillings, ten pence a day just to kill Germans. People said, Well, if you can have full employment to kill people... Why in God's name couldn't you have full employment and good schools, good hospitals, good houses? It's a very good question. In his book, Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds of Economic Policy, Warren Mosler explains the following. When our children build 15 million cars per year, 20 years from now, will they have to send them back in time to 2008 to pay off their debt? Are we still sending real goods and services back in time to 1945 to pay off the lingering debt from World War II? Of course, we all know that we don't send real goods and services back in time to pay off federal government deficits and that our children won't have to do that either. Nor is there any reason government spending from previous years should prevent our children from going to work and producing all of the goods and services they are capable of producing. And in our children's future, just like today, whoever is alive will be able to go to work and produce and consume their real output of goods and services no matter how many treasury securities are outstanding. There is no such thing as giving up current year output to the past and sending it back in time to previous generations. Our children won't and can't pay us back for anything we leave them, even if they wanted to. So what's going on? How can it be that the United States is currently the most indebted nation in the world, some 17.5 trillion US dollars worth of external debt? How come the nations that are equally highly indebted, the, the second highest indebted nation in the world is England, or the United Kingdom, followed by France, Germany, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Japan, all of these nations which have a comparatively high standard of living. How can it be that there is currently outstanding external debt of all of the nations in the world, if you accumulate it, it's 53 trillion US dollars of outstanding financial debt. How can that be? We're told that we're in debt to China. But China is the 14th most indebted nation in the world. How can that be? Where's all this money coming from? Who are we in debt to? How can it be that China has an external debt of 1.5 trillion US dollars, the 14th highest in the world, and we're constantly being told that we are the ones who are borrowing from China? The only nations in the world currently who don't have any public external debt are Macau, British Virgin Islands, Brunei, Liechtenstein, 
and Palau. All nations, all of those nations either use a foreign currency or they have a, a local currency that is pegged to a foreign currency. So what the heck is going on? Where has all this debt ended up? Is it that all the nations of the Earth are somehow in debt to some other nations on Mars or Pluto? Or is it that when a nation issues money, let's say the Australian government issues one million Australian dollars, it issues that money unless it receives one million Australian dollars back in tax revenue, then it hasn't balanced its budget. If it issues one million Australian dollars and only receives back 900,000 Australian dollars in tax revenue, then it has a deficit of 100,000. That money is somewhere in the non-government sector. And that deficit accumulates over time into a debt. So is it not the case that all of the nations in the world which have this massive outs outstanding external debt, is it not the case that their debt has just been given to people in the non-government sector who are now going around and using it in the economy? Isn't it true that one person's deficit has to be another person's surplus? That's just a matter of accounting identity. So if we were to balance the books, if we were to repay all the national debt, isn't it true that there would be no money left in the economy? If the Australian government reclaimed all of the Australian dollar liabilities that they had initially issued, if they did demand payment back from the non-government sector of all of the Australian dollars back to them, there would be no Australian dollars left. You would have to give back all of the Australian dollars in your wallet and all of the Australian dollars in your bank account in order for the government to repay the national debt. So in order to come to some fundamental understanding of what's going on and who's indebted to who and what do deficits and surpluses really matter, we need to do some currency analysis. And that's exactly what modern monetary theory attempts to do. And in this series of videos, we'll be explaining just how that currency analysis can be used to implement thoughtful, realistic public policy prescriptions to garner public purpose and to make the world the place that we actually want to live in. Right now in Australia, we still have more than 100,000 people sleeping homeless every night. We still have 570,000 Australian children living in poverty. We still have more than 1.8 million Australians who are either unemployed or underemployed. Can we do better than that? And if we want to make a better world, how are we going to afford it? Well, that's exactly what modern monetary theory can teach us. My name's been Gideon Cordova. This is My Two Cents Adjusted for Inflation. Thank you so much for joining me, and I'll catch you next time.